Hello everyone, my name is Athanasios Posansis and I'm Greek, aka Noseman. If you Google Noseman, I come up first. I work with uh, Maxon's education and training team and also with Cineversity. I'm also a Cinema 4D master trainer. You can find me on Twitter and YouTube and I do have an Instagram account, although I do not post there. On Twitter, you'll find me at NosemanGR, like Noseman GR, and uh, YouTube by name, Athanasios Posansis. Today, we are going to make some jellyfish, and they're going to have dynamic tentacles. Now, the way we're going to build it is a semi-procedural way, which means that we are going to build each stage in a procedural manner, but at every stage, we're going to save Alembic caches, and we're going to take those caches to the next level and add more procedural workflow. That way, you have a fixed output for every stage, and it makes it slightly easier and much faster to work with, and you can art direct things a bit better using this way. I hope you learned something today, so without further ado, let's begin. Let's begin by modeling the jellyfish. So, before I model the actual jellyfish, I'm going to model the object that's going to produce the deformation, that wavy motion. And uh, I'm going to do this by creating a sphere. I'm going to turn on my grow shading line so I can see the topology. It's always good practice to see what you're working with. And I'm going to set it to hexahedron. And uh, this means six sides. I'm going to increase it to 32. And by doing that, I'm getting this center line over here. So now I can make this editable and I can go to points mode and delete all the points underneath here. If I left something here, nope, I didn't. Excellent, so I have this uh, cap, which I'm gonna use as the main deformation object. I'm going to use the surface deformer to create the appropriate deformation. Now, before I do anything with the surface deformer, let's first create the wavy motion on this hemisphere. And I'm going to do that uh, very simply using a plane effector as a deformer. So I'm gonna call this cap deformer. And uh, if I select the plane effect and go to the deformer and set this to point, you will see that everything gets destroyed because by the default, the parameter is the Y, and we want the Z, which is the normal direction. I'm going to set this to 20. And uh, now this just does a very simple deformation, 20 centimeters in the normal direction for each and every one of the points. I'm going to go to the fall off tab and add a linear field. And I'm going to use this linear field after I orient it in the plus Y. And I'm going to make sure that it occupies the equal space that the hemisphere does. So let's go here and uh, set the field to 50. And you can see it seems to be overshooting. Uh, that's because we've applied the 20 centimeters we had before. I'm gonna make this uh, zero. Good, it's right there in the middle. Now, watch this, go to the remapping and I'm going to change this slope, which represents the amount of deformation applied from the bottom to the top. And I'm going to go and change the contour mode to curve. And th this curve, I want it to be a sine wave, so it will create that wavy motion. So right click in here, and uh, let's select a preset, which says sine wave. Excellent. Now, the other thing I'm going to do is set some animation because there is no animation. Now, this is just a static thing. If I move the linear field, you will see the wavy motion propagates. So let me undo that. And I'm going to go and say that I want this curve to repeat every 30 seconds. Now, if I press play, you will see that I get this wavy motion. And that's pretty much the motion I want for my deformer object. So let's go to our perspective view. Now, at any moment, I can change the field, the amount in the plane effector, or even the shape of the cap deformer to create the motion I'm planning to create. Good, so the deformer is ready. Let's go and hide this because now I'm going to do some modeling. And I'm going to create a null, call it temp. And whenever I want, I can just make it invisible so it doesn't bother me in the viewport. 
So I'm going to go to my side view, and now I'm going to model my actual jelly. I'm going to make it about one, two, three, four of these squares in a uh, length. So let me turn this off. Let me go and get my spline pen, and I'm going to very roughly create the top of the jelly and go here, do this. I don't really care about the details of the shape. Good. Let me just make sure that this point and this point are going to be at the zero, zero. Now you can see that for some reason, I'm not getting my coordinates manager activated. And that happens when you have more than one object selected. We still have the cap deformer object. So I'm going to select the spline. So now it's activated. So let me just zero these two numbers. Then let me just select this and zero the X of this. And I can go and sort of fiddle around these and move them to whatever position I want them to be. And this is the profile of my jelly. Uh, I don't know if you have ever seen a jellyfish, but they happen to have this thick part at the top. We can always go and change this at any given moment. Now, with this uh, spline created, I'm going to go and add a lathe object. And let's go to our perspective view and drag the spline in the lathe. And we have our jelly, a flat jelly. When they're washed out on the beach, this is approximately what they look like. And not this geometric, but that's another story. So let me now do the following thing. I want a bit more equally distributed polygons. I don't want these long ones here and so forth. And um, this is a product of two things. Number one, the spline doesn't have to be adaptive because then it only adds subdivisions when the angle changes so that it has a detail only when it needs it. Because I'm going to deform this, I want an equal subdivision. So go and set this to uniform, for example. And now we have all these equally distributed subdivisions. And I'm going to go to the lathe and increase my subdivisions to 64. So now everything looks a bit more uniform. And we can always go and change these things down the line. Excellent. Now let's take this jelly and deform it. So I'm going to drag this here. I'm going to call this jelly cap. And I'm going to add another null. And because it's uh, at the center of the world, I don't need to move anything around. I'm going to call this jelly deformed dev. And I'm going to go and add my surface deformer, make it a sibling of the jelly. And uh, I need to tell the surface deformer to reference some object in order to use that to deform whatever is underneath it. And the object we're referencing is the cap deformer. And you can see nothing happens. You need to press initialize. And of course, uh, this doesn't look very good. Well, it's funny, but it's not what I expected. And the reason is I'm using a projection type in my surface deformer. I want to set this to UV. And again, this looks even worse. Again, for some abstract piece of art, this may be perfect. Now, there are reasons why this is happening. The number one reason is uh, the cap deformers UVs. Because I'm using the UV mode, it needs to have proper UVs in order to work. Now, if I shift double click on this and see the UVs, uh, we have some sort of uh, cubic projection on this. And if you go to your UV edit and go to polygon mode, let's go closer here. Let's turn this on and turn this off so we can actually see the object. You can see the seams. So now if I go and select something, you can see this is the top. And then this here is the sides and the other half of the top. So you can see that things are not exactly as we want them to be. But that's a very easy fix. Just press Command A and select all your polygons. Go to the top view. Press H to frame it. And then go to the Projection tab and click on Frontal. And this is going to create a UV unwrapping, uh, which imitates whatever you see in your view when you press this button, this frontal button. And uh, I need to get rid of any distortion, because if you go here and look at the distortion, you will see we have quite strong distortion around these edges. So just select all and press UV unwrap. And now we have a bit of distortion, but the contrast between the blue and the red is not too strong, which means that we have a bit of distortion. But for what we're doing, this is perfect. You can change the UVs to match whatever you're trying to do, but I'm not going to do it. So let's go back to the perspective and let's go back to our standard layout. Now what you will see when I turn everything on is that 
the jelly looks much, much better. But still, you can see that it only occupies about half of our deformer object. And if I go to my side view, this is going to become very much obvious. You can see here that the jelly is using only half of the deformer object. And that's because, again, the default settings for the surface deformer set the scale to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0.5. Now, if you set this to 1, 1, and 1, this will look a bit better, but it does have a problem. Let me turn this off again. I'm going to turn things on and off so we can see things clearer. If you go down here, you see we're getting a bit of messed up geometry. And that's because at the edges of the UV tile, uh, we may have some mathematical errors and it's trying to wrap around. And anyway, the easiest fix for this is just to make the value smaller, slightly smaller. And um, the value I found that works really nice is 0 0.95, 0 0.95 and 0.9. Five, so we don't get those artifacts and now we have our little jelly and if you want to change the shape because maybe it's too tall uh, don't touch the jelly itself just go and modify the cap deformer so you can go and scale this down and you will see that the jellyfish is going to adjust accordingly so let's uh, go to the side view so we can see it a bit better uh, let's turn this on temporarily. Let's select all the polygons. Let's scale them down. Let's press play. And you can see now the jellyfish looks much better. And I think uh, that is all I'm going to do with the deformation itself. So let's close these harakis here. And uh, the deformed jellyfish is uh, ready to receive some more modeling details. Let's go and create some nice little patterns underneath here. So there's one number I need to remember, and that is the number of subdivisions, rotational subdivisions. I want it to be equally divisible with the shape I'm going to do, so it's uh, nice and symmetrical. And uh, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to turn off the surface deformer, and I'm going to apply a deformer before the surface because uh, the deformers uh, work in the order they appear in the object manager. So anything I put over the surface over here is going to execute first, and then the result of that is going to be deformed using the surface deformer and so forth. So what I'm going to do is uh, create a flower, and I'm going to put it on the ground plane, just like this. Let's make it a bit smaller and bring in the inner radius. And I want to make sure that this number, the petals, and uh, the number of subdivisions is equally divisible. So 64, and here we have 8, and that will be 8 times 8 equals 64. And you can see that all these lines fall exactly in the same places on the mesh. And that's just going to give us um, a more uh, symmetrical uh, deformation. Uh, visually, it won't really make a difference, but I love to talk about these things. It makes me seem smarter than I am, which, I mean, I am a genius, but uh, that's a different story. Not for now. So I'm going to use this flower, and the way I'm going to use it is, again, by adding another plane effector over here before the surface, and I'm going to call this plane flower, and I'm going to go and set the mode to be points, and you can see everything moves in the wrong direction, and let's uh, zero out the Y, and let's go and add some of the Z's here. Good. And you can see that uh, everything is moving uh, upwards, inside or outside. Anyway, I am going to show you something that's very important later on, but for now, this is what we have. Now, in order to get that pattern and uh, use that for our plane deformer now, we need to go to the fall off, and I'm going to drag the flower in here. And uh, I going to select the spline field now. Let's bring this up slightly. And I want the spline shape to be curved as it is and the distance to be radius. And now you can see that we're getting this nice little pattern. Now you may be wondering why these are moving upwards inside the model instead of outwards. And uh, that is a very, very important thing. And I'm glad you asked the question, although I asked it for you because we need to make sure that our normals are oriented properly. Because we're going to use this model with spline dynamics, with hair dynamics, we need to make sure that the normals are pointing in the right direction. 
Unfortunately, there are two things you need to do. So first of all, if I take this uh, jelly cap and I copy, make a new document and paste it in a new document and then make it editable. If I go to the polygon mode and select all, you can see they are blue, which means they are reverse. So let me close this document now. So I know that the model has reverse normals. How do I fix that? Well, you go to the jelly cap and you flip the normals. So now the direction of the points moving is the correct one. But there's a small gotcha. If I turn on the surface deformer and uh, I think that everything looks absolutely fantastic, let's now go over here and right click and say current state to object. And this is going to make a polygonal copy of whatever the setup is and uh, make it uh, a copy of the object. So I'm going to cut this and paste it in a new document. Now, if I select this and go again to points mode, you will see that they're reversed again. But how can it be? I just reverse them. I fix them and they're broken again. Well, there is a reason this is happening. And if you don't know this, it will catch you. And if it catches you at the wrong time in your project, you're going to have some work to do. Now, let's look at the surface deformer. And you can see that we have positive scales. Well, unfortunately, the UV coordinate system is reversed compared to the XZ coordinate system. So what we have to do to fix this is go and negate one of these numbers. So go and set the, let's say, X value to minus 95. Now, not much will change, but now if I right click and say current state to object and cut this and paste it in a new document, now my normals are going to face in the right direction because they're orange. So when you're using the surface deformer for anything you want and normals, for whatever reason, are important to you, make sure that one of these scales is reversed. Otherwise, you're going to have reverted normals. The other thing I could have done is just make sure that the jelly cap has reverted normals to begin with. So bring this back to its default state with not flipped normals and let the surface deformer flip them for you. So make sure at every stage before you start baking stuff and complicating your scene to make sure that your normals are pointing in the right direction. Because as far as Cinema 4D's renderers are concerned, they're very forgiving when it comes to normals. But other renderers, especially GPU renderers, are very strict when it comes to normals and you're going to have problems with transparencies and subsurface scattering and stuff like that. So always look out for your normals. So I like this. And if it's a bit jaggy, I don't really care because at the end, I may put this under a subdivision service object and look at how nice this looks. Now, the great thing about this setup is that it is procedural. So I can go to my flower and change things and make the shape look any way I want it. So that looks fantastic. Now, if for any reason you want other parts of your model to have different shapes, you can uh, change how that flower affects your object, make it a bit bigger. I like these uh, little bumps here, so I'm going to leave them. And let's see how this looks. And I think it looks fantastic. So it's up to you to add more details to your jellyfish. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm very happy. So for now, I'm going to remove the subdivision surface object and leave this in this resolution. So it's quite fast when it plays back. So the jelly and the deformation of the jelly is finished. So now we're going to do an intermediate baking function because I want to have the final deformed jelly baked so I can go and create copies using MoGraph. So let's go and uh, create an Alembic file from this particular jellyfish. Now what you will see is that every second this loops. So I don't need to record more than 30 frames of this. If I press play, you will see that it loops really nicely. So set this to 30 frames. And uh, I only want the mesh output of uh, this particular jellyfish. And for that reason, what I'm going to do is go and add a connect object. I'm going to call this jelly animated. And I'm going to put the whole hierarchy underneath. Make sure that you turn off the weld. Because 
if the world is on and two points happen to be within the tolerance and they're going to be welded you may have a uh, point count differences from frame to frame and that will make number one your alembic huge and number two you'll have problems with motion blur and stuff like that so just make sure you turn it off now what i'm going to do is a right click on the jelly animated and say bake as alembic and it will just take a few seconds to bake this now if you want to make sure that it works properly just go here cut this go to a new document paste it in and just press play and you'll see what happens now you can see it does one loop and then it stops I want this to uh, repeat so go to the play mode and say loop so now it's just gonna loop forever and the file is relatively small and of course what you could do is go and put this under subdivision surface object if you want it to be a bit smoother now that the jellyfish is complete, let's go and deal with the motion. And we're going to do that in a new scene just to have things a bit simplified. So create a new project and I'm going to go and create a sphere. I'm going to set it to be a hemisphere. I'm going to use this as a guide uh, so I don't need to use the actual jellyfish. Not yet. So let me turn on my raw shading lines and I'm going to consider this to be a static jellyfish of sorts. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is go to one of my four views, and I think uh, the right view is the best, and uh, dolly out, and I'm going to draw a spline on which my jellyfish are going to swim. And I think this is good enough. Let me press Escape to accept the shape of the spline. Let's go back to my 3D view and press H to frame my whole view. Now, I want to use this as the main motion, but I don't want my jellyfish, I'm going to create four of them, to move on the spline. I want uh, them to move around the spline. So let me fix that. I'm going to create a helix and I'm going to use a spline wrap as a deformer to the helix. I'm going to call this helix motion. And uh, just make sure the spline is on top, uh, not that they will make a huge difference now. The other thing I want you to pay attention to is where the arrow is pointing, the arrow of the spline wrap. I want it to point through the helix. So just select it and you can see we have the Z axis here. Change the axis to Z and then drag the spline in here. And we're going to get the spline that's wrapped around the other spline. Now, the problem here is that you see these weird sharp turns we need to do a couple of things i need to go to the spline and set it to uniform and add quite a few segments and then go to the helix and add some segments here i'm going to make this uh, 300 and internally these are much smoother now it seems to have a kink but uh, we'll take care of it later on now what i can do is use a cloner to clone my spheres which are my jelly proxies and I'm going to clone it on the spline, on the helix, by going to Object and dragging the helix motion in here. Now, I only want four of these. And uh, what you will see is that if I go to the rate and I set this, let's say, to 30% and rewind and press play, that these are moving in the wrong direction. The easiest way to fix this, instead of making this number negative, is to go to the spline itself, go to Points Mode, right-click, and go to point order and reverse the sequence. So now the spline is going the other way. And you can see that my little jellies are moving a bit fast, but I can change that just by changing the rate. Let's make this 10%. Excellent. Now I need to bring these closer to each other. And in order to do that, I need to change the start and end. If I bring the end closer, now you see that the jellyfish are closer to each other. So that's the first thing I need to do. The other thing, and you may see some kinks in the motion, and I'm going to extend this to 180 frames. You will see we get some snapping here. Just make sure that smooth rotation is on, and now they're gonna rotate a bit smoother. And if you see any kinks happening here, what you could do is go and make your helix uh, a bit smaller because uh, now the turns are too abrupt so i'm going to make this 50 and this 50 so they are going to go around but not as much i'm going to double the rotation times two so they go around excellent now i want to change the orientation of them so go to the cloner 
go to the transform tab and let's find which rotation that is it's not this one and it's this one so I'm going to change this to the closest 90 degrees so now they're moving on the spline outside the other thing I want them to do is sort of rotate around as well and uh, the best way to do that is to make sure we have a rail spline and the rail spline is going to be after I stop and rewind is going to be a copy of the helix motion so I'm dragging pressing command or control I'm going to call this helix rail I'm using the same spline to deform it and I'm going to make it 120 and 120 so it's bigger it's away from the other spline so let's go to the cloner and drag this in the rail rewind press play and now you see that they are rotating at the same time which I find very interesting if you want them to rotate less all you have to do is go change the rail maybe I divide this by two and now you're going to see a sort of rotation not as much as you had before but good enough nonetheless fantastic if you want to smooth out the motion to avoid any kinks or add any other secondary effects select your cloner and just go and add a delay effect and uh, you can increase the number here in the blend and make them move a bit more smooth so let me just delete the delay effector so I'm happy with what I have here in terms of the main motion and again you can add random effectors move them a bit further up further down you can even do part of that here in the cloner by changing for example the rate variation or the offset variation and rewind press play and you will see that you get a slightly different speed between each and every one of your jellyfish uh, the only thing I am going to do is change a bit the not the offset uh, amount the variation but the actual end just so that these can move at a larger distance between each other now be careful because this may loop around there you go it loops around so make sure that this is short enough or the spline is long enough so you don't get the wraparound of any of the clones so that nothing appears here before your frame resets to zero excellent so I'm just going to stop and rewind. I'm going to go back to my other project and uh, bring in my animated jelly. Here is my animated Alembic. I'm going to copy it here and take it to the other scene. Let's paste it and uh, replace the sphere with the jelly. And if I rewind and press play, you will see that now we have the animation as well as the motion. Now you will see that all jellies move exactly at the same rate. And to change this, we're going to do a nice little trick. I'm going to make a copy of that Alembic jelly. I'm going to change the offset. So one of them has a different timing. And then I'm going to tell the cloner to not iterate, but blend between these. So now each one has a unique frame at which it starts. So they seem to be swimming at a different rate. But nonetheless, that's quite interesting. So this is all good and uh, the next step is to add a component from which the actual tentacles are going to be emitted when we use the hair. Now you can argue that I can emit these tentacles from the Alembic itself but that makes things a bit more complex. What I am going to do is create a separate object that will only emit hair and itself won't be visible to the render. And because I want that emitter to be in exactly the same position with exactly the same animation as the jellies, I'm going to use a peculiar method so that I can recycle this animation to as many cloners as I wish. To do this, I'm going to make some room in my object manager. Then I'm going to take this cloner and I'm going to make a copy. And I'm going to select the first cloner and I'm going to go to the MoGraph menu and select the Swap Cloner Matrix. And this is going to actually get rid of the cloner and create a matrix with all the same effectors and all the same settings as the previous cloner. And I can go and delete these clones because they're not going to be used. Now, what I'd like you to pay attention to is that this particular matrix now, I'm going to call it Motion Matrix has all the parameters I created earlier. 
like the motion, the spiraling and the turning and all that. And uh, for the cloner now, instead of using the effectors and all that, I'm actually going to take the motion matrix and put it over here. And immediately all the parameters disappear because now the cloner, instead of using the previous set uh, object spline and helix motion and the rail and all that and the rate, it's actually putting a single clone on each one of the matrices. So where you see those little squares, that's where each and every one of the jellies is going to be placed. So essentially nothing has changed other than the source of the motion of the jellies. I'm going to call this cloner jellies and stop the animation and rewind just in case I need to edit parts of these videos to make it seem flawless. Excellent. Now, how do we create that emitter? Well, number one, make a copy of this. And because it's referencing the matrix, then anything we do to the matrix is going to affect both of these cloners. So we don't have to do things in two places. I'm going to set the name to cloner emitter hair. And instead of uh, an animated jelly, which I'm going to remove, I'm actually going to go and create a disk. Make the disk a child of this cloner emitter hair. And you can see it now. We can go close with the camera. You can see it. And uh, they move in unison with the jellies. If I want to raise it up, I can go and uh, add a null to this because if I go to the transform, nothing really is going to happen because each and every one of these goes and sticks where each matrix is. But if I select this and I group it or press Alt G to create a null in that position, I'm going to call this emitter null and press enter. Take the disk and go to the coordinates and raise it up so it's closer and inside your jellyfish. I'm going to make the outer radius a bit smaller. I don't care if it's touching. I just want it to be away from the edges and make sure that throughout the animation it doesn't intersect. Not that it will be uh, very visible. Select this disk and add an inner radius because I want my tentacles to be emitted by these polygons over here. So what I have in this case is the same animation that's been applied to the emitters. The great thing about this particular setup is now I have a separate file that deals with how each jelly swims. And I can create three or four different types of uh, jellyfish and uh, do all sorts of other things to make my scene more interesting. And at the same time, the animation of the school of jellyfish eye, fishes, anyway, uh, of jellyfish. I think that's a correct one, the school of jellyfish. The animation is controlled by this setup over here, which is fairly simple and doesn't have the added complexity of having the deformed jellyfish. Not that you can't do it or you shouldn't do it, but I find uh, this way more convenient and more easy to control. So how do we proceed from here? Well, I am going to export two alembic files. One is going to be the jellies and one is going to be the emitter. And upon those alembic files, we're going to emit the hair. So when you are using clones in order to create objects to save as alembic, my experience has shown that using a connect object and exporting that connect object is going to give you the best result. So I'm going to call this jellies or and let's create another one. Go here, create another connect object, and let's go here, put it down over here, and call it emitter all. Excellent. So now, one by one, I'm going to go to the jellies all, right click, and bake as alembic. If you have saved your file, it will create an alembic folder in the root folder of your project, and it will put that in with the name that the connect object has. And it's a fairly fast process for 180 frames. I don't need to say more than 20, 25 words, 26, 27, 28, 29. You see how that goes. I'm going to do the same thing for the emitter. Now, you do see that we have the red A. I did this on purpose. That's because I forgot to turn off the weld. 
and some of the points may have welded through the deformation, which means this is not an interpolated alembic. So I'm going to remove it, make sure that the jellies or an emitter all don't have the weld button activated, and let's go and do that one more time, and I'm going to fast forward. And now you can see that both alembic files are green, and that means that we have full interpolated points. The number of points is consistent, and the only thing that gets saved is the position per frame. And uh, now that I have these two, I'm going to put them in a new file. I have now pasted those two alembics inside this new document, and I can see everything playing in real time. Now remember, it's 180 frames. There we go, we have the full animation, and you can scrub through and do all sorts of fancy things. Fantastic. Now let's go and add some hair, and let me show you what you need to do to make this work nicely. So I'm going to go to Emitter All, I'm going to go to the Simulate menu, Hair Objects, and Add Hair. And you can see that they're facing the other way around. That's because my normals were reversed. All I have to do to fix this is go revert the normals of the original file and save an alembic again. To do that, just select the disk and go and set this to minus Y. So nothing really seems to change, but the alembic is going to have proper normals, proper facing normals. Right click, bake as alembic. Just so that you know, I'm going to paste the new emitter, the new alembic over here. I'm going to remove the previous one and look at what happens here to the hair when I do that, when I delete the reference. The hair suddenly gets these little green things. This means that they are unrooted. It's just hair that um, happened to live over there in that particular point. So the association between the previous object, because it doesn't exist, and the hair doesn't exist anymore. What you need to do is select your hair and link the new file. And again, if you press play, nothing is going to happen. So you need to do something to make the connection. If you look here in the Guides tab under the Roots group, you see it says Root Custom. That's what happens when we delete an object. It goes from one specific type of connection of hair to polygons to this custom. And that's what this green thing, these green little circles indicate, that your roots have been set to a custom position. All you have to do for the object that's linked is to set this to, let's say, polygon area. And then you need to go to the editing and you need to regrow this hair. And now they're growing properly. You have to do these steps if you want to regrow the hair and want them to be connected to that object. So before we do anything else, let's go and rewind and press play and see what happens. You can see now the hair is dangling nicely. Excellent. So let's go and do some changes to this hair. Number one, I am going to select the hair, drag it down here, and call this tentacles. Press enter. And first of all, I'm going to make them very long. So let's go for 400 and uh, make sure you press regrow and sometimes update guides if they don't update. I think they're still too short. Let's make them 550. There you go. So regrow and everything seems fine. At this point, and depending how you did the reconnection, you may end up having fewer hair than you expect. Let me show you what I mean. If I render this, you will see that we only get hair where the guides are. That is a secondary effect of deleting the original emitting object. And uh, as you can see, if we go to hairs over here, you see that the number of hairs is grayed out and the roots are set as guides. So we're going to have one hair, one tentacle per blue guide. Had I done this originally without having to swap my emitters, that wouldn't be the case. So let me show you what I mean. So let's select the emitter, let's go here and uh, add some hair. And uh, in this particular case, you will see that the hairs is active because the roots are auto. This is the default state. And if I were to render this, you would see that we would get a lot of hair over here. We would get 50,000 hair in total. So that changed from auto to as guides because we deleted the original emitter. 
be extra careful when you're changing various parameters and especially links within the hair because some parameters may change without you realizing it but having said that we want the roots to be as guides so each and every one of these blue guides is going to be a specific tentacle excellent so let's go and fix the dynamics first before we do anything else, the hair dynamics. Currently you can see that they're dangling as ropes. It doesn't look like uh, these jellies are moving in water. So let's uh, fix that. I need to go to the forces and remove the gravity. So I'm going to set gravity to zero. Rewind, press play, and now you will see that they're flowing nicely. Now they are sort of moving away because they're moving at a certain speed which means that we need to go and fix some things in the dynamic settings in the properties we need to go and add some extra drag so that the hairs drag instead of sort of moving um, around as if they're ropes so let's go here and add 25 percent drag rewind press play and now you will see that they're a bit better Excellent. So that's good enough. I like to change the mass, although I haven't seen an enormous uh, difference in the way uh, they move around. But anyhow, that's what I like to do. So rewind, press play, and you can see that now the hair is moving nicely. Now let's go a bit into the art direction side. I'm going to go around here. I don't want these to start straight. I want them to have some sort of waviness. To fix that, we go to the simulate and we have a whole host of uh, different tools for the hair. So what I'm going to do is go to points mode so I can affect all these points and then go and bring up their hairbrush tool. Now before I change anything, you can go, I can brush these and make them uh, nice and change their shape so we get an interesting start. The other thing I am going to do is select the hair go to the guides and set my segments to 32 and I'm doing this for two reasons number one that this way the hair is going to be a bit more floppy and soft and uh, less rigid so to speak and uh, number two because the collisions are going to work better with more segments because the collisions are based on the points you see here and not the spline itself so let's go here and change the shape of this one and let's go to this one and change the shape over here just to make them a bit more interesting let's go here i don't mind changing the one on the bottom because i'm going to fix it last there we go we have this nice little wavy motion and let's go here and comb the hair brush it and move it this way excellent so we have a bit of nice uh, organic motion already now before you do anything else don't forget go to simulate go to hair edit and set initial state this will store this particular state as the original beginning default state so let's rewind press play and you will see that that's how they begin from that nice bent state fantastic i may have these jellies moving a bit too fast but i don't really mind now let's continue with uh, a secondary bit of motion before we go into the actual collisions and i'm going to go to the simulate and bring up a force a turbulence force and i'm going to set some random values here and rewind press play because these forces are going to affect our hair i can go and increase the strength and this will add a bit of uh, waviness in what we're doing excellent i'm speeding up because i think i'm running out of time but nonetheless let's go and add those dynamics now so i need to take my jellies and make them hair colliders so right click and let's go to the hair tags and set a hair collider to these jellies and now you're going to see the simulation is going to run slower but now we get collision avoidance and that looks excellent the other thing i need to do is make sure that the hairs collide with the other hairs there's hair to hair collision this is going to slow things even more but we are going to bake this out so go to your hair go to the forces tab and enable hair to hair rewind press play and you will see now that the simulation is going to go slower but we have hair to hair collisions which is going to make it extremely interesting so i'm going to stop this 
I'm going to rewind. I'm going to bake an Alembic. But how do I bake Alembic? First of all, I can bake the hairs as curves, as they're called, or I can bake them as splines. What I like to do is go to the Generate tab. I want to generate splines. So go here and select Spline. And now this object, when baked to Alembic, is actually going to generate an Alembic with splines. So let's do that. Right click, bake as Alembic, and through the magic of editing, we have our Alembic splines. So I can turn these ones off, and then I can go here and scrub. And everything you see here is really, really nicely made. Now, you will see that we have these collisions here. And uh, as far as I understand it, that is a priority issue. But it's fairly simple to solve. If you go to the Alembic file and you offset the frame, I think by one, you get exactly the collisions you want without any intersections. Excellent. Now, I can always go and change the collision margins and all that, but uh, that's a different story. Now, let's go on to the final leg of this setup. And honestly, I can get rid of the hair if I want to, but I'm going to leave them here just to annoy you. Now, you may see that the A is red, and that's due to the way that splines are generated through hair, that the point count is not always consistent, but I have no problem. Let's go and create some actual tentacles. And uh, to do that, I'm going to use my preferred method because it works fantastically with motion blur and all that, as I've shown in a recent tutorial. And uh, I'm going to do it by using a cylinder and a spline wrap. So if you haven't seen that tutorial, please head on to Cineversity and see it. And let's drag these things down here. Now, first of all, what is the thickness of uh, each tentacle? And I'm going to set it to one centimeter. And uh, I'm going to put the spline wrap underneath this. And for the spline wrap input, I'm going to use this Alembic file. I need to make sure that the axis is a plus Y, because uh, that's how the cylinder is uh, oriented in the plus Y. And uh, the other thing I need to do is increase the segmentation of my cylinder. So I need to go here. Rotation segments, I don't need many. I'm going to put eight. But height segments, the best practice is to use as many subdivisions as I used here or more. So I'm going to set this to 32 because I'm a bit in a rush. And now we have proper geometry as tentacles and everything plays back in real time, which is absolutely fantastic. So with that said, I can make these tentacles invisible and rewind, press play. And you can see that we have our school of jellyfish and uh, the hair is intersecting and everything looks fantastic. And we can go to any of the previous stages and make changes and then just propagate forward anything we have changed. Although it seems to be the least efficient method, in fact, because you're going step by step, it allows you to compartmentalize each and every one of your processes and make sure that there are no mistakes. The last little tidbit uh, is that you can go to the spline wrap and uh, you can add a rail spline if you want them to uh, work properly with motion blur, which is going to be something very simple. You take the tentacles, you make a copy of the tentacles and you can see them here. You move them to one side and you go to the spline wrap and you use the secondary one as a rail and this will orient these cylinders so they are stable in terms of their rotation. And you can hide that as well. Again, that was all in a tutorial I made. And uh, finally, you can even go and change the geometry of the tentacles so that I can go to the size and I can go to the end and add some sort of thinning down. I can make my cylinder have, let's say, 64 segments so it's even smoother. And I can do all sorts of other refinements all while I can play this in near real time. So this will work with any of your renderers, Cinema 4D Standard Render, Physical or Redshift. Well, I hope this was uh, educational and entertaining with an emphasis on the latter. 
Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter at NosemanGR or on YouTube, Athanasios Posances.